So, Professor Greg, you, you may start your lecture. Thank you very much for, for participating in our workshop. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a, a delight to be here. Welcome from my house to yours, uh, from Canada to Brazil. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I uh, look forward to giving you a talk on expansive soils. Um, is my Can you see my screen? Ah, very good. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, be, very good. And so, yes, today's lecture will be on uh, advancements in expansive soils engineering, talking about the specific issues and how we've characterized them and how we can design around them. And so what is an expansive soil? Um, probably most of us have that idea, but they are also known as volume change soils or shrink swell soils so that the emphasis isn't just on the expansion, but also the uh, shrinkage that can happen. And here we have two examples of that. Um, and these expansive soils respond to changes in suction. We have an example on the left where we have given access to a little sample here of expansive soil and it increases in volume by almost 60% just by decreasing suction to zero or giving access to water, as much water as it could take. On the sample on the right, we've uh, done the opposite. We've compacted a soil here and given it access to dry air or very high suction. And in that high suction environment, the sample shrank and shrank uh, over 75% of its initial volume. And so these kind of soils respond uh, to these changes in suction. And here we have plotted on a uh, volume change versus matrix suction. And so we have volume change on the y-axis, suction on one of the x-axis, and normal stress on the uh, axis coming into the page. And we often think of soils changing volume due to changes in stress, as we've thought about since our first soil mechanics class. And these expansive soils also change volume due to this matrix suction. And so increase in suction decreases the volume and swelling or expansion occurs during wetting or decreases in suction. And the results are often and can be very dramatic if not done properly. Here we see a number of examples of lightly loaded structures like a driveway, a basement, and we see the large cracks that can happen from differential differential uh, displacements. A shear crack you can see there, and this homeowner here has done everything they possibly can to try and fight this problem to no avail. And this is uh, one of the themes of the lecture is the desperate times and desperate things that homeowners go to. Where do we find these soils in the world? Here's a soils map. Um, and the soils in North America here are these dark green and light green ones going through the central part of North America, stretching across from east to west. Um, and I believe these are the ones that you have in Brazil along the uh, eastern shores in the, in the same colors. Um, but you can see in any of the continents around the world, we see the problems of expansive soils and, the, and those issues are, are there. And so that's kind of our first um, issue we might have with expansive soils. We have a expansive soil that's composed with a specific clay mineralogy. And these are montmorillonite or bentonite clays. Um, that can be organics that also lead to this expansion. And at its fundamental uh, core, we have a double layer clay atom with uh, a negative charge. And that negative charge is either filled with cations and uh, they, those molecules come together. Or if it's filled with water, then it's pseudo neutralized, that, that negative charge. And these molecules and these particles are driven apart at the particle level. And then we see that in the bulk as expansion. And so they have the first character of our play is if we are going to have issues with expansive soils, we obviously must have an expansive soil. What else do we have to have that we're going to need to account for in our expansive soils engineering? And that is climate. Climate and weather cause that suction change. So we have an expansive soil. Problems happen when moisture content changes due to suction change. And where does that happen? That happens in this near surface unsaturated zone where we get wetting, drying, rainfall, infiltration, evaporation, transpiration, and cyclic, either seasonal, annual, and even daily moisture or suction cycles, leading to these changes in the near surface environment. Um, how has that changed over time, right? Our climate isn't constant. Um, our air temperatures, for example, here on the left, we have our temperature anomaly um, over the year, and this is the global, at a global scale. 
And we see in the 1880s, our temperatures were down here in the blue zone, and these have steadily rose over the last 140, 150 years into the temperatures we have today. And so the past from the temperature measurements we have show warming over time, causing higher suction. What does our future look like? Well, let's look at a RCP uh, 8.5 scenario. And here we have temperature in the dark red uh, increasing another seven and a half degrees based on from, from those 1880 to 1920 temperatures. And let's look around the world. Everywhere it looks like it's getting warmer. And in Canada in particular, it's increasing quite dramatically at the, at the very northern parts. And so we're getting uh, two to three times the temperature in terms of degrees warming in our Arctic predicted in the future. And we can see a lot of Brazil also is in that three, three degrees area. So we're, we're all in it for this warming and we're, we need to account for that in our design. So we need to understand the past as well as anticipate the future. And that's just air temperature, right? That air temperature doesn't get transferred to the ground immediately. It takes time. And so we have transient effects. Here are some ground temperatures. Um, this is clearly from Canada because we see the x-axis down here has minus 50 and plus 50. So we're clearly in the Canadian Arctic somewhere. Um, I'll just hit play. The black dot is the air temperature and the line is the near surface ground temperatures. And we see that even on a daily scale, right? This is a daily uh, time temperature uh, measurements. Even daily, we're seeing the temperatures in the near surface, kind of in the nearest meter, responding day to day. And even over this kind of seasonal warming, there's summer in the Canadian Arctic, uh, plus five, plus 10. Uh, not, not the kindest place to be, but incredibly beautiful, incredibly dramatic. And that was summer right there. And now we're going back to winter. And but we see that the point of this is to see the time that it takes in this near surface environment for those air temperatures to get transferred down to the ground. And when we talk about climate change, that's going to take on the order of more and more years and decades. So the components of weather that are affecting the surface are those temperature ones we've been talking about, relative humidity, and then also precipitation. How is that going to change? Well, here is um, in Canada, we've developed a climateatlas.ca, not me personally, but the government has. And this is looking at how our climate's gonna change in the next number of years. And we're in types anticipating a very wet period. So plus 30% here in terms of changing uh, moisture or precipitation. And again, more dramatic changes in the Arctic. And so what's happening here is we have our second character in our play. We have an expansive soil and we have climate there that are going to cause these, these temperature or so these suction changes. What's the third one? And the third one, of course, is an engineering application, some sort of infrastructure that's going to change that regime. So we can get suction changes due to climate, and then we can remove that. Uh, we can remove some vegetation and we can put on some infrastructure and that's gonna again change the suction. So here is a plot of uh, pore pressure versus time or pore pressure versus depth and kind of the dry season, higher suction, wet season, lower suction, and an average drawn in the middle and what is that, what's gonna happen when we start in that average sense with some sort of vegetation and we remove it and we build a house or we cover that evapotranspiration. We do two things, we remove the roots, we remove that vegetation, that's gonna to lead to increased suction. And then we cover it. We usually put some sort of uh, foundation or we pave and we've done two things. We've done two things to decrease the suction. And so over time, again, that suction is gonna decrease at the surface and that's gonna be transferred with depth to some new equilibrium. And then if our homeowner does something and it can be something as easy as changing the downspouts or doing something else, we can actually have a second equilibrium. We might get full wetting. They could do something untowards. They might change the drainage, something on that they would think would be have a very minor effect, but with a little bit of change, we can get this dramatic volumetric response. So let's look at a case study here. Uh, a high risk situation are these lightly loaded structures. So houses, two story, one story houses, they are low cost, quote unquote design. There's actually a handbook you can use in Canada to design the foundations for these structures. There's usually little or usually no site investigation, maybe on a kind of area level. And it does exactly what we just described. It interrupts that ground climate interaction and often as we see heaving under the center, right? We get moisture and suction decrease under the center. And then if we plant vegetation around the outside, you see this tree growing, roots going down below the foundation. 
And we see that we're getting settlement and these differential settlements are very damaging and often seen as unavoidable. Homeowners feel at a loss and in this case led to some extreme actions. So I'm here in Kingston over here on this kind of blue dot at the end of Lake Ontario. And we're gonna move over to central Canada, right in the middle of this dark green expansive soil area. And let's zoom in here. We see we are in central Canada, a um, few hundred kilometers from the, our friends in the United States. And what do we see here from a satellite or Google map image? We see roads that are very straight, and just for scale, this would be a square mile. So that is 1.6 kilometers or one mile. These are extremely flat areas, the flat lands of Canada. Uh, it's the bottom of a post-glacial or a, a, a glacial lake. So a, a lake that formed in front of a glacier as it was retreating back to the north and expansive clays deposited over a glacial deposit or till and very well knowing known swelling issues in southern Manitoba or central Canada. Um, let's look back to when this house was constructed, 1977. Um, two by six walls, so two inches by six inches walls in terms of the wood dimensions covered in plywood and a little two inch by 10 inch, a 10 inch wide footing constructed out of uh, wood again as a foundation. But there was many issues, years and years of periodic maintenance and 30 years later, the homeowners were thinking about selling, but unable to sell as is or unwilling to just from a, an ethical point of view. And a very handy owner decided to replace their perimeter walls while living upstairs uh, with wider, thicker walls and a wider footing. Um, and this is to ex ex just show you the extreme, extreme, um, extreme actions that homeowners take. And you may have guessed, or you may not have, but this is a very personal story. This is my bedroom window where I grew up. This is my parents' house, and that's my dad on the excavator, or maybe the person he hired. And he did a basement replacement around a wall. He exposed the basement. Again, this uh, just to emphasize, this is something of an extreme owner. Um, not necessarily recommended, because you'll see the end of the story, but the, the second time they got it right, I think. Um, here's a wall removal. There's my dad and the neighbors. Um, they've jacked up the house on, on piles and they have are now extracting one of the basement walls. There they are, layering it out on the front lawn as you do. And they poured a new concrete foundation over here, two feet or uh, 50 centimeters wide. And there's the new walls being placed. Um, the end of that story is that was about 15 years ago and the the, as we'll see later, the, the normal stresses decreased because of the larger footing and the expansive soil issues continued. We see, you can see lots of roots in here. You can actually kind of see the waviness of the uh, exterior walls. And so in this last summer, a year ago, uh, they installed piles. And this is a really smart solution. This is taking the loads of the house, putting them much below the the uh, active layer or the wetting drying layer. And this is their a proper solution of putting a house up on, on screw piles. So this was done last summer. And so we have our three characters. We have a soil, structure and climate uh, conspiring to cause issues in engineering. And so the rest of this lecture is gonna talk about how we can advan do advanced characterization of our expansive or volume change soils, a unified approach to expansion and swelling, uh, a simplified modeling approach, some physical modeling, and then thinking about interactive design and observation, right? These, these problems take are, are devastating, but they also take time. And perhaps we can use time to our advantage to know when we should go back in and fix some of them. Okay, so let's start with some advanced characterization. Let's think back to the swelling part of the problem and look around the foundation. Here is a water table at depth around a uh, basement foundation. We have, a, uh, we have a two situations. We have kind of the soil underneath the center is under some stress, some all around mean stress. And perhaps the one around the side is under some little less stress. And let's say something happens, we lose the drainage control at the top and we get some ponding and our water table rises to the surface. Our soil around our foundation will expand. And if I go back and forth, you can see two situations have arisen down here below. Our soil has expanded under a constant stress situation, so a constant total stress. Um, the 
the the overburden pressure hasn't changed from a uh, kind of soil uh, and vertical stress from our foundation, but we've saturated and our soil has gotten larger, caused some differential expansion here, and but under relatively constant stress. What's happened on the side of our foundation over on the right side is some sort of constrained expansion, right? Now we have a stiff basement wall here constraining the expansion, and there's some sort of boundary limiting how much volume change can happen. In an extreme event, we could see constant volume where we have no ability to expand, but some sort of soil structure interaction is happening there. And we're able to capture this in a couple of experiments. We're able to capture a free swell as well as a track seal swelling under controlled boundary conditions. And so this is a paper that I myself and grad student uh, PhD uh, Bifong Lim published in ASDM. And what she did was she created this apparatus you see on the right. We were interested in what happens at zero stress. So she compacted samples, she put some PIV markers on them, and then we could take pictures and do digital image correlation and also weigh them daily and get their moisture content change versus time and their volumetric expansion. And so we see here in the left, we're plotting axial, radial strain and volumetric strain. And which is with our, with our we can get this with our uh, PIV results. And the this is after 10 days, or I think this square right here, we've got 60% uh, approximately expansion. And so this is happening actually very quickly because of our small size. We looked at different sizes, different rates of wetting, and we found out that the, the smaller is better as it happens faster and we get the same answer. Um, and so if you wanna know what happens at the surface, that's the kind of expansion you could expect under wetting conditions. If you wanna know what's happening under the foundation or beside, there we did a, during my PhD, I uh, developed a track seal apparatus for this kind of experiment. Um, the current, ASTM standard is to use an odometer or one dimensional conditions and basically bring the sample to a certain stress and then give it access to water. And under low stresses, it'll expand. And after some point, it will experience some collapse. Um, and this assumes one dimensional conditions, which we know are not usually valid in the field. Um, and so what I developed was a, an, an apparatus where we could measure the volume and control it and apply wetting conditions. And we applied the wetting to the perimeter through a geotextile and infiltrated into, we had a relative humidity sensor to measure suction and volumetric control. So we could apply constant mean stress conditions right under the foundation, um, constrained conditions, which are constant volume, and then a spring-like boundary. We could change the stiffness of that boundary by applying a, a, a spring-like boundary to it and increase the constraint or reduce the constraint. Um, what does that look like from a um, analysis point of view? Well, let's look at volumetric strain versus mean stress. Uh, we start at a certain value, we increase the mean stress, and so our sample decreases in volume slightly. Then we give it access to water, so we saturate it. And if we keep that constant mean stress boundary, uh, our mean stress stays the same, so this is mean total stress and our sample expands under that boundary. If we take another sample, we prepare it again, we take it to the same initial stress, and then in this case, we apply constant volume boundary. Then when we flood it with water and saturate it, then it in incurs no volumetric strain, but swelling-induced stresses. And so we get a swelling pressure or swelling-induced stresses is how I refer to it. And that swelling potential is the same at this initial compacted or whatever the pre-wetting conditions are, it's the same swelling potential. And that can be realized either as volumetric expansion, uh, stress increase, or on that spring boundary, it follows some sort of value in between. And so we were able to test many uh, samples this way. Um, after the initial tests on a very swelling 50-50 bentonite sand material, um, we also applied that with other types of soils. So the spent, we'll see this results in a few pages or a few slides. Um, we did some Lake Agassiz clay or Winnipeg clay, same material that that uh, case study is from. And then bare paw shale or some very 
uh, some deeper samples of bare paw shale, which was under investigation for a geo for a geo uh, groundwater study, and a potential uh, repository study. We also did these tests on. And the question, of course, is those you know we have hundreds and thousands of odometer tests. Can we relate those to triaxial tests? And those bare paw tests gave us that data. It allowed us to confirm in this case that we could use an elasticity assumption and we could get our um, mean stress equivalent. So the swelling induced pressure we achieved and measured in the triaxial, we could relate that to a swelling pressure that we got in hundreds of uh, odometer swelling pressure tests. And so it allowed us to, in, to go back and forth. And if we have triaxial results, we can give someone the odometer swelling pressure, or if we have swelling pressure results, we can use that in triaxial tests. And so with this advanced characterization method, we can take it from the low stress to no stress environment to any kind of stresses. And we took this in the in those 50-50 bentonite, we took this to uh, 1,500 kilopascals, um, and so, or 1.5 megapascals, so very high total stresses. And uh, the system with the geotextile flooding worked quite well. And we can relate them back and forth. So here we have ability to control in a triaxial experiment and understand what these swelling properties are. How can we get uh, how can we use these or is there some sort of unified approach to understand swelling? And so this came out of those initial tests on the bentonite sand material. And here's those results that we kind of went through in cartoon form, but now have some data. So we have mean stress on the x-axis, specific volume or void ratio plus one on the y-axis. And we see our constant mean stress test starting at a certain stress, expanding, um, realizing that swelling potential at constant stress, a constant volume test, realizing that swelling potential at uh, a constant volume, and a constant stiffness test, realizing that spring-like boundary in between. And then did a, a numerous number of tests, took them to either 250 kPa, 500, 1,000, 1,500, and realized that um, we're really approaching a limit to swelling. This line that we drew and the line that we understood at the time, and so two of these tests, let's say the 250 constant volume test started at 250 kPa, imposed those constant volume conditions, and came across and ended up right there, where which an over 900 kPa kind of swelling pressure. And the 1000 kPa sample, constant mean stress, ended up in very close uh, final state. And so what we interpreted this as being a limit to swelling. Is this uh, swell equilibrium limit or swelling equilibrium limit sometimes as the limit to swelling achievable at a given a certain initial conditions and boundary conditions. And so from that uh, initial test on the 50-50 bentonite, so those are the experiments we just showed right here, that's down here. This gray area is the swelling potential. We're starting on our isotropic compression line. That's where we're only giving it mean stress. We're swelling and then under those certain boundary conditions, we're gonna travel through and define the entire, the maximum swelling potential. And for that 50% bentonite, for the Lake Agassiz clay, again, quite a large swelling potential. For the bare paw, for the conditions we tested it under, uh, seemingly smaller and perhaps some collapse showing. Um, but what this gave us the ability to do was to begin to develop a database because we know the equations of each of these swell equilibrium lines and in the form of A plus uh, B times log P. And what that gives us the ability to do is to plot the SEL parameters A and B versus liquid limit and plastic limit and swell potential. And we can see that, well, of course, we're getting a very good R squared. We're on the, we're, we're happy to see a linear relationship. It's probably not linear, to be honest, if we had values in between these extreme ones, but this is working very well at this time. And we were able to go back in time, right? So we used three experiments to develop these A and B parameters. And we used our ability to go back and tra uh, translate Traxil and odometer results and we found a sum of Del Fredlin's swelling pressure results of a different expansive soil, compared our predicted uh, curves, 
and they worked out extremely well. And so we thought this was, uh, so Bi Fong's paper here, what worked out amazingly to be able to quantify the swelling potential of expansive soils. Okay, and so the swelling, the SEL, gives us the ability to um, predict what's gonna happen to the soil, given a swelling potential of a certain soil, an initial volume, and the boundary conditions that are happening during swelling. Um, and how can we use that? And we develop, we found a simplified approach to implement this in a finite element model. Um, and this was uh, using that same idea of a basement foundation. We have a, right, we're again looking underground. We're at a shallow burial here, and we're looking below the foundation, below the basement slab. We're looking at a constant mean stress boundary condition and adjacent to the wall, some sort of constant stiffness to constrain swelling condition. How can we achieve that in a, a simplified or a, a, a basic approach in a finite element model? So what we did was we calibrated the finite element uh, properties. And so we used an elasticity approach and calibrated the expansion using those swell pressure tests. And then using those stiffness parameters, uh, simulated how much this basement here would swell for a free swell condition. And then we pushed it back to simulate the constrained condition. So it was kind of a two-part approach to get the swelling pressures. So how did that work? Well, we brought it on the left here. We took it from a certain initial value, compressed it numerically. Then we let it expand and calibrated that expansion, that initial free swell modulus. So we called that the free swell modulus for our 50-50 bentonite and our Lake Agassiz clay. And then we would have loved to be able to, you know, we could have done coupled hydraulic mechanical modeling and incorporated all the constitutive models and done a constant volume wetting. Um, but we wanted to do a simplified approach. And so we just numerically, of course, squished it back and did a recompression module, a recompression back to its initial volume. And so as we see here, we had free soil modulus and then recompression modulus to essentially push and, and bring that back. So let's see what that looked like in the finite element. So here we see the uh, expansion, right? We see the initial shape of our, our foundation here in black, the ho beautiful horizontal line and walls. And we see how that expanded using that free swell modulus. And then um, the slab here is under a constant mean stress. And so it makes sense to leave it there. And essentially we took each of these and pushed them back to their initial, initial uh, location and measured the stress it took to do that. So now we're plotting local elevation or I guess depth versus swelling induced pressure. And we see that the, those elements near the surface took the highest pressure to push back into place horizontally. And the ones near the basement, at the basement took, took less pressure. And these pressures align well with what we see in local basements in swelling, swelling soils. And we were quite happy to see that that simplified approach allowed us to understand where this is happening and how it could happen. Um, of course, we needed to check to make sure we weren't yielding our soil from a passive pressure point of view, but it allowed us to push back slowly, 40%, 70%, and then all the way back to the initial location and see what that swelling induced soils took. Okay, so we have advanced characterization, free swell. Um, we've characterized our soil. We've uh, developed a simplified modeling approach. I would love to use field data, and I do have some from a parent's house, but there's a real lack of instrumented sites. I have only found a very fine handful, and my colleagues that I've talked with also have very few. And so what we took to is physical modeling. Physical modeling in a centrifuge, to apply wetting drying cycles and um, to an expansive clay. And so this is a conference paper published at the uh, Physical Modeling Conference back in 2018 with grad student uh, Steve Laporte and colleague Riley Bedeau and in preparation for a journal paper submission. And so we took this, instead of going deep and doing the stress and the uh, 
and the boundary conditions, we started with a road simulating a shallow foundation constructed on expansive clay. And so to speed up time in the centrifuge, we, uh, I'll, we took advantage of the increased gravity to get the stresses correct, the, the stress profile, and increased the speed of time. And we're we, we learned and we were al uh, allowed to and were able to apply three wetting drying cycles and look at the response for this soil structure uh, climate interaction. And so, of course, this is a shallow foundation, a surficial foundation. And the idea, of course, is the next step is to, to move it into a shallow foundation in the future. And so what are we simulating? We're simulating wet period and so in dry periods. Um, and so essentially we're pouring on a, a season worth of rain that either infiltrates or goes into our ditches. And so we get ditches around uh, next to our roads. Once that water is ponding, it's going to infiltrate down. And it's also going to take time again to infiltrate under our road. And what we expect is to see a curved up um, road. And then when we turn the rain off and it all evaporates, we blew in dry air and then we evaporated and then our, our soil cracked and shrank. And we expect our road to go down into tension there and, and shrink at the, at the edge. Um, but if you're going to put this in the field, it's very hard to put instrumentation where you want to. The few ones that I've seen either have, you know, we could, we could put a survey crew out once a, once a month and or perhaps we're measuring deformations here at the center line but really it's it's the wrong place it's the least amount of deformations okay so here is our centrifuge at rmc it's a broadband uh one and a half meter diameter and up to 300 g um, and we were running at about 60. and so there's our little payload here's our expensive soil with a road on top and we fit a canon rebel camera with a special lens and we also could live feed this with a webcam over the time of the experiments. Um, here's our climate controlled chamber where we could put on the rain and then an atmospheric chamber where we could then blow through dry air and induce that evaporation at the surface. The cross section was to simulate a two lane highway. Um, essentially we're cutting this at the center line here and um, we applied a wax. We basically just we didn't worry about trying to match the uh, stiffness of the asphalt. We didn't worry if it was asphalt or concrete road. Um, we basically painted on some wax to make it impermeable and so no water could flow through the road. Um, at 40 G here everything goes down to 1 40th scale and so that scales our 3.3 our meter wide road scales to 82.5 millimeters and the soil we used was a 90% kaolin spiked with 10% bentonite. And that gave us a similar uh, plasticity index to soils we have in Canada. And we were able to apply three wetting dry and cycles. And here's some results. Here's a wetting cycle. Now we're plotting the vertical deformation. Um, our road is over here. Here's our uh, back view of a car. And uh, we see the, the most uh, wetting cycle, the most expansion right next to our, our, our uh, ditch. And then if we move forward in time, so that's at the end of 21 days scaled up. Um, the next drying cycle it saw about 15 to 10 or 15 millimeters uh, decrease. And so out here we see this going up and down. At our road, we see things decreasing as we go to the center line. Similar on the expansion, we see that same kind of, uh, once we get away from the boundary, we see fairly uh, horizontal vertical deformations, wetting and drying. And so we were in good, happy to see those horizontal uh, contours out in the field, let's say, near the, and that allowed us to focus on the road, which is what we were really interested in. Um, these results on the right are plotting the vertical deformation of different patches under the road. So patch one here is the one near the edge, and that's the one expanding the most. Patch 10 is way over here, and it's really not seeing a lot of expansion. Um, and patch one there is responding to wetting period, right? wetting period, drying period, wetting period, drying period, wetting period, drying period, and responding most dramatically to that climate interaction. Um, but it takes time for that to occur. And we it's, a, it's the type of system that never achieves 
um, equilibrium never stops moving, right? The, the, the edge of the road is always experiencing the weather of the day, and it's either going to be drying or wetting, expanding or contracting throughout. Um, the, and so we were able to, again, watch those three cycles and see that happening over time. Um, and here is the PIV results. Again, we're looking at the center line on the right, the edge of our pavement on the left, and we see millimeters of expansion scaled up at prototype um, up to about 20 millimeters of differential movement. And we see this also taking time to travel to the center line. The other really interesting thing is if you, you can sometimes see it here, but at times the, the edge of the pavement is going down and the center of the pavement is going up. And this thing is going out of cycle. And so in usual understanding, it's seen as kind of a bird flapping its wings, let's say. And here it's much more dynamic. It's much more you know, responding in time to how long that wetting period was, how much water was infiltrated, and how dry the period was after. And so some really um, unique results, unavailable to unless you were sitting there with a camera and able to take multiple images a day. And so here is a, a cartoon of what we just saw. We saw the pavement at the edge responding immediately to the climate, the Saturn line taking time to respond. Um, underneath, we saw a drying front proceeding and following the, pre the previous wetting front. And so wherever that wetting front is traveling under the road, the road is rising. Wherever that drying front is passing, then the road's going down. And we saw this happening where at times the edge of the pavement is going down, the center line is going up, and it depends on all, all sorts of uh, materials and um, edge effect and uh, climate effects. And so, yeah, so we're really learning more about the time it takes for these to occur, the quantifying, the um, you know, filling in the gaps between these really valuable field cases and learning the soil structure interaction. Um, in this kind of first part, we looked at the advanced characterization of these expansive soils, that unified approach to swelling, how we can use advanced physical modeling capabilities to get that uh, continuous monitoring and the first time to actually see the entire profile of deformations and strains at depth. And now we need to consider the future, the, the past, the current, and then the future design, uh, climate in our design. And we also can take advantage because it takes time for these problems to develop. Uh, the solutions can th take that time as well. Okay, so let's think about interactive design for the remainder of this talk today. Um, and we can divide this into different kinds of cases. Um, new structure design, right? So we're moving into a new area. This could be where we're um, right, moving into a new area of a city, taking down the current vegetation and right, we do this in Canada all the time and we have uh, area developments that's happening in my area right now. We're clearing out an area either previously used for agriculture or uh, forestry and we're putting in a whole bunch of houses, changing that climate ground interaction. And we're taking the pre-construction kind of suction, right, back to thinking about suction. Over time, it's going to come to a new equilibrium. And we really hope that our homeowners and our city planners and our maintenance people aren't going to do something to cause that sec second equilibrium or really flood things terribly. Um, our new structure design should look at the past climate and the future. It, even the past year, has the past year been dry? Has the past year been wet? Where is our soil, where is our near surface soil going to be? Um, you want to control the drainage around the structure. We need to look at what's happening around our structure, ensure positive drainage. And once we decide on something, let's let that first equilibrium happen. Let's not change it. Don't modify, don't modify, right? Control the vegetation around the structure. Again, don't modify the vegetation. Any, any uh, additional perturbations after the initial one is, is just could cause more problems. Even better, it's, it's the, the smartest thing you could do is let a whole season or a whole year go by before development, right? So if you're going to take down some vegetation, wait and then be able to put on the new roads, infrastructure, houses, and give that ground a chance to go through its most dramatic response before you start putting infrastructure on it. And finally, the, just a, a really important thing is communicating with our owners, right? The homeowner especially, 
communicating with them that they what they do with their drain pipes, what they do with the water moving around their house plays an incredible role in how their foundations will respond in these kinds of situations. And so our design options for foundation and the environment are really to think about controlling one or more of these things. We can't control the climate, right? The climate is out of our control, but we can control our foundation and we can control our moisture, right? What can we do from a foundation point of view to optimize our chances of success in the future? And so here's a few options. The ones that we're using here in Canada, and this is coming out of the uh, new version of our Canadian Foundation Engineering Manual. And this is coming out this year, or maybe in early 2022. Um, let's give that ground somewhere to go. Let's take the stresses, let's put, it, let's put our, our houses on piles. These piles should be founded down below the wetting zone, right? The active wetting drying zone. Let's put the, let's uh, found them deep below the actively wetting and drying zone. And then let's give ourselves what we call a crawl space. Um, that just means excavate below our floor slab, right? The floor slab on a grade beam, um, again, uh, being supported by piles. And below that floor slab, let's give some space. Let's give that ground that used to have, you know, might be very dry from a trees and grasses that we've removed the normal stress through an excavation and now we're covering it and leading to high, um, you know, decreases in suction. Let's give it a let's give it a chance to expand. That chance to expand here before it encounters any infrastructure can save your flower, right? That that crawl space can can give it uninhibited volumetric response. And then when we put piles and grade beams, that gives us a chance to raise up our our floors and um, allow us not to have to replace. So we'll see some pictures here in a second. Or you could go with a stiffened slab on grade. If you're going a slab on grade um, and you know you're going to get some differential movements, stiffen, stiffen that up. Stiffen slab on grade to give you uh, that, that moment of inertia to support and the stiffness and the reinforcement placement to support, support your fill. Um, we can also protect this with some waterproofing and some fill below there, some fill replacement. But the, the, the method, the option here is to really go with a really stiff uh, slab on grade. If we shift over to the other side, we could look at moisture control, right? So if we, instead of thinking about the foundation or in combination with the foundation, we can think about attaching a geomembrane to the edge of our, our uh, houses and then directing the flow to some uh, farther away place. So if we're gonna get, have moisture conditions, it's going to come to some equilibrium underneath here, but any of those, uh, we're essentially doing what we did, what we showed with the, uh, with the highway and the, the physical modeling of those highways, right? The climate boundary is gonna happen way over here. And that center line of the highway, which didn't move, is where our house is gonna be sitting and our, our, our lightly loaded structures are gonna be sitting. So that's gonna direct the moisture flow away. Um, other people also use capillary barriers, uh, remove and replace and also uh, in some areas some line stabilization or other stabilization and and this is just the idea is just to take that moisture variation and move it farther away um so here's what can here's another example of uh, what can happen if you don't do it properly right we see some heaving of this basement slab this is not a slab on grade or this is a slab on grade and unstiffened <laughs> um and we want to help homeowners right the idea is to solve these problems so homeowners don't have to go through those extreme actions. Um, you know, when you're in, a, and we have eras, right? In our cities, we have eras of design, eras of construction practices. Um, and this is gonna vary from region to region within a city, within a country. Um, and the local practice is going to, the knowledge of that local practice will often govern what you can do. Um, in this case, you see an un, unreinforced slab here that had to get jackhammered and hauled out of this finished home, right? Another extreme and necessary act by a homeowner to solve a problem. Um, and that kind of brings up the question of, of who decides how this is gonna get paid for? Um, and is it, right? And, and that gets decided not necessarily by engineers. It could be by um, insurance agencies or regulators when is a building failed? Is if this floor slab has cracks in it, is the building failed? Is it bad design? Who who should pay for that? 
Um, and this is very different from a floor slab in a house to a, you know, a foundation of a manufacturing building or a place where you have a, an overhead crane, right? So the, how a building fails, it becomes very, um, it's not, it's not an easy way to write a regulation or a design guide. Um, and so we need to keep the application in mind in these designs and, and then use our knowledge and our, 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 our advantage of time, the advantage of time we have. These things are in low permeability and looking at the time that we can, we can interact with our, with our design. Uh, we want to take a risk-based approach, different risk for our basement slabs that we see here versus a machine foundation, monitor, right? Get our homeowners, get them, teach them how to, to look and notice when something could be happening. And that communication is key. Make sure they're understanding what, what little changes can happen to their design and what to their to one of their main investments in their lives. Um, retrofitting. So that was kind of a new design kind of thoughts, what we can do to a new construction. Um, retrofitting, a really uh, great idea is screw piles, right? So taking those loads from our houses, putting them deep below the active zone. So deep below where any of these roots might be. And this is again from my uh, parents' house. And what they did, they had, uh, they welded on these kind of, well, after they drilled the screw piles down, they cut them off to size, and then they welded on these plates. And then you can see, we need to think about how much can we jack on this, right? This is now jacking the house that's out of alignment. We're trying to jack it back into alignment and re-level the house. Um, but you can see, we need to consider, I wonder how much reinforcement they put in that slab, how much reinforcement they put in that footing when they constructed it, and perhaps think about how much we want to be jacking on that foundation. So we see some potential issues there, um, but that the in, in a principle, properly designed, this will would be a really good way to um, retrofit. Um, but it does bring up other issues, right? This picture, we see, um, you know, the question of corrosion. We see our shafts here with a lot of corrosion, and that could be designed for and accounted for as a as a corrosive coating. I'm not saying that it wasn't, but it, it definitely could be. And then some high corrosion resistant uh, screw piles in this case. So some good good engineering needs to consider corrosion and that time. Um, and then how they're being installed. Um, the design current design practice is to for the installer to monitor the pressure or the torque or the pressure or the uh, hydraulic pressure in this case of or in the interpreted torque applied and basically go for a certain torque level and calling that an adequate uh, bearing capacity um, and is that design or practice or how 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 is that calibrated and should it be should there be there, there could be some more work done there um, but in principle taking the loads and moving them deeper I'm a, I'm a big proponent of and then again, use our observational approach, use that time to our advantage and have good decision makers making those decisions, not randomly or um, inappropriately, but use experienced engineers to take us to that one equilibrium, and keep us from going any further. Okay, so thank you so much for your time today. Um, we looked, looked at advanced characterization of expansive soils, uh, unified approach, that simplified modeling approach, um, the physical modeling, and then thought about interactive design and what we can do in a new design case, as well as a retrofit.